What a night it was in the NBA, and we have it all covered on NBA Today. Scoring, it was at a premium across the league. 26 players had a 25-point game. That ties the most in a day in NBA history, and that hadn't happened since 1993, but that wasn't all, so let's get to more scoring records. 15 players had a 30-point game. That also ties the most in a day in NBA history. And Joel Embiid's 50-piece, Nikola Jokic's cool 49, and Luka Doncic's 41 points. That led the night. And Wednesday was the first day in NBA history with three 40-point scorers that were all born outside of the United States. And you know what else? Eight players, eight, had 30-point double-doubles. And yes, that was also tied for the most in a day in NBA history, which had been done two other times. Giannis Antetokounmpo, he had 33 points and 15 rebounds. And Ja Morant, he had 33 points and 14 assists. So just great production everywhere after a 13-game slate. And all of that added up to teams averaging 114.4 points per game. That is the highest scoring day this season in which 10 or more games were played. So I am excited to break it all down with these fine folks. I have Kendrick Perkins, Mr. Carry On himself, Chenea Gumake, Adrian Wojnarowski, and Tim Legler. And we're going to get to all of that, ladies and gentlemen. But we are going to start with the Los Angeles Lakers. And we're going to go all the way back to Frank Vogel's pregame press conference last night, where he was asked if he felt like he was under siege. I don't feel like I'm under siege. Uh, it's not hard to do my job. I, you know, I'm very focused on the task at hand. I've always been that way. high expectations this fan base really cares it's a big market all right so that's how it started but let's get to how it's going because lebron james and the lakers they were hosting the pacers last night and yes we know what happened in that one but we're gonna go over it anyways it started out all right right the lakers were up and lebron james finished with a Authority on that pass. My goodness. But then the fourth quarter, we might as well have just called the fourth quarter the Karis LeVert quarter because he was on fire today. Yeah, he was. And this was a battle of point guards. And unfortunately, right here, one-on-one isolation, Russ likes to get to, get to the paint, but it was a 5-for-17 night from the field for us. Now, look at how he responds, and this is why things happened that went poorly. He's on defense. He doesn't really necessarily look engaged. Again, Karis LeVert's going off. Plus, he's going to his right. He was never down in a stance, so that means a change had to be made. Well, and that is the moment that Frank Vogel yanked Russell Westbrook from the game, but it was too little, too late. Karis LeVert, he was already going. He had 22 points in the fourth quarter alone, 30 for the game. This is the ensuing Lakers possession. And of course, LeBron, LeBron James, James. Nope. not quite enough. They would fall 111-104. Here's Frank Vogel after the game. Frank, you um, opted to go uh, with Russ on the bench at the end of the game. What were you, what, 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 were, what were you looking for there? What was the thinking behind that, behind that choice? Yeah, playing the guys, I thought we were going to win the game. How was Russ after the game? Did, is that the sort of thing that bothers him? Um, <laughs> have you followed Russ throughout his career? Not as closely as you have, probably. Okay. Have you followed Russ throughout this season? Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you think that would bother Russ not being in the game? So Russell Westbrook, he had another tough night from the field, shooting 5 of 17. However, he had a rare hot hand from three-point range, making a season-high four three-pointers. But Russ missed 10 of his 11 shots from inside the arc. So when we launched the show on October 18th, since then, I don't think we've had more conversations about any individual player outside of Russell Westbrook. I know we're making a push with John Morant right now, Perk. It's going to be okay. But last night, to me, though, it felt a little bit like a tipping point for the Lakers. Frank Vogel benched Russ because you just heard it. He wanted to go with players that he said he thought would win the game. So, Perk, I'm going to start with you here. Was that the right decision by Vogel? It was. It was the right message. Um, You know, sometimes you have to send a message to certain players, whether they're franchise guys, max guys, or whatever, to let them know that this won't be tolerated. And as we saw in the clip, look, Russ, you missed the shot uh, and didn't get back in transition, didn't give no effort on the defensive side of things, and that's just uncalled for. And so when you have a guy like LeBron James who comes out publicly on Twitter, on social media, and tell the Laker nation, Laker fans, whatever you want to call them, that he's going to be better, that's accountability. And right now, Russ is not is not holding himself accountable. We him in the press game conference when he's saying things to the nature of it's more than basketball it's just life no Russ 
No, this is ba it's basketball right now. It's about championships. And Legs, you brought up a point about four months ago, four months ago, that you said they might need to consider bringing Russell, Res Russell Westbrook off the bench. I second that. You know why? They need to move, they got to move LeBron again. Here it goes. We got to move LeBron from the center position back to the point guard position. Maybe start Dwight Howard, but Russell Westbrook has to come off the bench because him and LeBron just can't coexist at the same time. Well, Perk, we heard Russell Westbrook after games in games past, but last night he left the arena without speaking to reporters. And so, Woj, we kind of saw what happened on the court there. What has ensued since? Well, Lakers got on a plane today and headed on you know, a sizable road trip, and they headed mm -hmm. to Orlando. Uh, Rob Palenka, the Lakers GM, is on that trip, and I would expect that he and you know, Russell Westbrook are going to have conversation either on the flight or when they get to Florida today and Frank Vogel because what's going to be key now for the Lakers is what comes next, what are the conversations now about what this means, and like Perk said, was it a message for a single game? Is it the beginning of a role, a role shifting, and I think LeBron James's role in this is going to be important. His leadership, uh, his voice, mm -hmm. and getting uh, Russell Westbrook, the organization, you know, to a place here where they can figure out how they can move forward. There's no trade out there for Russell Westbrook. There's mm -hmm. no, there's nobody taking on his contract and the way he's playing right now. That's that's not there. So. They're going to have to figure out how to make this work. And listen, the, the benching of Russell Westbrook last night at the end of the game, that is not just a coach's decision. That's an organizational decision. Frank Vogel's not doing that without uh, the organization signing off on that. And Dave McMiniman reported that today, and that's certainly the case. And so what happens next? What are the conversations that are going on today? On Dave McMiniman will join us with his reporting later in the show. But... That flight to Orlando, Woj, that is a long one. And, and Tim and Perk, Janae, you all have played, and Janae, you still do, play the game at the highest level. So for that you know, long airplane ride and this ensuing longest trip of the season, Tim, I want to start with you here. What needs to happen from a player perspective for that cohesion to exist so that they can move forward in these conversations? Honestly, obviously LeBron James, leader of the team, and whatever he says and whatever his body language is, whatever indications he gives, he doesn't have to come out and say anything publicly. He doesn't have to indict Frank Vogel. He doesn't have to publicly support Russell Westbrook. It's all about body language, innuendo, what he may not say. LeBron James right now is in control, really, of this situation. But I think really what it comes down to for Russell Westbrook, some introspection. You know, if he takes this as a personal slight, and Woj and I were talking about this, and Perk, you'd probably agree with this. I was trying to think. This has probably never happened to Russell Westbrook in his career where he sat on the bench at the end of a close game. One right? time. You can remember one time ago. One, one time when I was with the Oklahoma City Thunder, we were in the we were in the playoffs against the Mavericks, and Eric Maynard was playing well, and Scotty Brooks didn't roll with Russ towards at the end towards the the last stretch of the fourth quarter. So, so it's only happened mentally, one time. right? One other time in his mm -hmm. career, and that was years ago. Yep. Right? So now this guy's won an MVP since then. He's mm -hmm. averaged triple double four times since then. He's dealing with a lot right now mentally and emotionally, but if he's being honest, if he can be honest with himself Preach. about the way he played last night, in particular the fact that you saw the defensive effort or lack thereof getting tuned up by the opposing point guard, clearly letting his offense affect his defense and his effort, if he really looks in the mirror and has introspection, they can get past this. If he comes out and just plays with all-out effort against Orlando, and if he wants to make this a personal thing, and LeBron James most likely is going to have his back more than Frank Vogel's. Frank Vogel could be in trouble. I mean, he may not get through this season, although I think that would be a mistake. If they made a move in season, you're not going to benefit from that. But I think, I think LeBron right now is the guy, is the key. Is he going to support Frank Vogel in this or not? And what he said after the game last night, that didn't look like it. Ironically, what you guys both outlined is exactly what happened to me my mm. last two seasons. You know, I played for the Connecticut Sun for five years, and then I got traded to the Sparks, and on that team has Candace Parker and Chelsea Gray, and of course my big sister. And it was hard for me to transition from being a top option on one team, and then now knowing that this is a championship team, and it requires that exact same honesty. And I think the only point I differ is, I know the question sometimes seems to be black or white, start or bench. Sometimes it's just realizing your role has to change. For me, I came off the bench for my team, and that was a better position for me. But if that meant starting a few games, you just have to be open-minded about where you are relative to where the team is. And that's the position Russell Westbrook is in right now. I will give concrete examples of what Russ probably needs to do. 
He leads the NBA right now in turnovers. Number two is James Harden. He's turned the ball over 188 times this season. If I'm a player, I was in that position. I'm like, I've got to lower that number to put my team in a better position. Uh, yes, people are not guarding me per se from three. That's why I feel more comfortable making shots. What do I do? All right, maybe it's not always shooting. Maybe instead of assisting, it's screen assisting. Dribble handoff. And now that shot is for another shooter, getting your teammates going. And then lastly, you know, you have that motor that everyone talks about. Bring that on defense. Mm. You know, I'm not surprised someone in his position is benched when your player that you're guarding is going off like that. That is normal no matter whether you're LeBron James or the last player on the bench. When you're under 500, you know those are possibilities as a top-tier athlete. So I relate to this scenario, and I do think that it's all about honesty and self-reflection. I do want to get back to something that Tim touched on, though. We should go back to where this all started. Frank Vogel, pregame, he said he didn't feel like he was under siege, and then the Lakers lost. And again, this is their fourth loss in five games. So here's what the players had to say about their coach and where the blame should lie. He's handling it. He's, I mean, he's here. He comes in upbeat every day. He gets on us when he, when, he, when he needs to. He do a good job of showing us and, 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 and putting us in that position is to see what we're doing wrong. And you know, I, I think the easiest thing to do is to blame Frank, is to blame the coaches. But we out there. We out there playing. We the ones that got to go out there and do it. Coach staff has been great. Uh, they put, a, put us in position to, uh, you know, to succeed, and it's up to us to go out and, and handle the business. So you know, there's always things that we all can do better, but there's no blame. Okay, so that's what the players are saying, supporting their coach publicly. But what does the future hold? Woj, what's the latest on the future for Frank Vogel in Los Angeles? Listen, the Lakers want to give Frank Vogel every chance they can to stay in this job. They don't have the depth on their coaching staff that they might have had in previous years to make a coaching change. You get past David Fisdale, and if you'd make David Fisdale the interim coach, now you have the rest of his staff that is largely a more inexperienced staff. It doesn't have former head coaches on. It doesn't have, uh, there's no Jason Kidd there. Listen, if Jason Kidd was still on his staff, he might be the head coach by now, but he isn't. And so, listen, the organization, I think, is trying to allow Frank Vogel to get through this, get Anthony Davis back. Uh, there's something Kobe Bryant said to Rob Palenka. He's said it to me a few times through the years. You know, sometimes the hardest thing to do is nothing, and I think that's kind of where the Lakers are right now. But, listen, there are issues that go. Legs has talked about this, Perk Cheney. There are issues that go well beyond coaching, the roster construction, injuries. And, listen, no one can survive the kind of loss they had to Denver the other night. You lose by 37. Your team's non-competitive. That's the stuff that gets coaches fired. Uh, but the way they came back, played against Utah, I think gave him a little more cushion and – Ultimately, it is very difficult to run an organization with the idea that your coach is game to game, that you're judging mm. him just on a game. It's not the way you should do it, and I think Frank Vogel is going to get yeah. more runway here uh, to coach this team and at least get to the end of the season. Oh, and Perk, we were texting last night, and, and you were a big supporter of sticking with Frank Vogel a little bit longer. Why? Yeah, for the simple fact that if anybody knows Frank Vogel, anybody knows Frank Vogel, they know that he's not that alpha like type coach that doesn't listen to his assistants, right? So his assistants has a lot of freedom. You look at a guy like Phil Handy, for example. Phil Handy is a guy that been with Braun and won championships. He's well respected by players. Phil's there the same way. So it's not just Frank Vogel, it's the whole coaching staff. And again, if I'm Frank Vogel, guess what? I'm thinking, sitting up here saying, man, I might need to walk away from this before I catch a heart attack dealing with this nonsense. Because, look, even when you look at, when you look at even with Carmelo Anthony coming back last night, it took away from Malik Monk, okay? Carmelo Anthony, I could count five times where he messed up on the defensive side of things. And then you put Coach Frank Vogel in a pickle because you know that all of a sudden Melo is a fan favorite. Mm. You know Braun rocking with Melo. But how can you sub them out when you just uh, – it's, it's just – it's hard and it's unfair to Frank. Well, and we just saw a graphic of what Frank Vogel has achieved as a head coach with the Lakers. It's still wild to me that we're only 15 months removed from him winning a championship. He was given a one-year extension. Other coaches after winning a championship, you see them extended. Mike Budenholzer, for instance.